just want to say thanks for joining us, folks, for joining us for the Larger Stories Book of the Month webinar. Going to be chatting today with uh, about the book Connecting, a book that uh, my father wrote in 1997 is when it was published, so wrote it a few years before that. And it's an interesting book, the book Connecting. He um, he really wrote this book at a time in his life that was um, a lot of different things happening, to say the very least. And this was really the beginning of a shift that I think many of us have seen in the in the in the the, the, the books coming after this, really towards the whole notion of spiritual formation and spiritual direction. So um, we're going to jump right in today. Uh, we're excited that today is actually happening. <laughs> Uh, just to give you people a little bit of background, um, initially we were going to be joined by a friend of mine from Florida who's a counselor down there, trained by dad years ago. I've known him for many years and he caught COVID. Um, we chatted last week and he said, I just don't think it's going to be able to happen. And after chatting with him, I said, I think you're exactly right. So I got another uh, person that um, was really excited to join me today. And he called me this morning early and said, I have a, a horrible stomach virus going on. And I don't think I'm going to be able to do it either. And I said, I got you, man. Um, I, uh, I feel for you. Get well and um, we'll take care of it. So who's always on deck for me is my good friend and, uh, and, and family friend, uh, almost a brother to me, Duncan Sprague. Dunk, thanks for joining me today, bro, on this last minute uh, webinar here. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you, Cap. It is. Uh, I, I love the fact that you... Um, I feel like this is a repeat story of what happened a number of years ago when your dad said, hey, I tried to get Kep and Ken to go with me on a trip and they, neither one could go. So you're our third option. <laughs> you're the third son in this case. And so I feel like I'm playing and I am the third son in my family. So I'm used to this order. Good, good. good. Well, I'm <laughs> glad that this worked out so well this morning and uh, when, when you and I were chatting. And it was interesting as we were talking about this. Um, how how much that this book has kind of impacted you? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, this is just I, I I don't like to say anything's really coincidental anymore in terms of some things, but it's amazing that you and I are getting a chance to do this um, today after even hearing where you were when this book was in process. T talk to the people who are joining us today about what what was going on during that time, and that you were invited into a small group of people who were kind of yeah working with Dad as he was writing this book. Yeah, this is the book that I would say was the beginning of my uh, my deep friendship with Larry. Um, prior to that, the two years previous to this, I had gone through the counseling program with Larry, um, and then I had um, interned under him. But in those two years, I, I never really got much connection with Larry. Um, it wasn't until I finished the program that... Um, Actually, my wife had applied for a job to be Larry's secretary. And uh, it, this shows you the character of Larry. Um, Larry and Rachel took my wife out um, for, for lunch and said, um, and I, we're thinking, oh, he's taking you out to lunch. He's offering you the job. And what Larry said was, up until a week ago, it was your job. But then the right person came in. And we just wanted you, you to know that you were the right person up until this last week. And I'm going, and, and that really became this turning point of our friendship that my wife was entered in, was invited in to Larry's community. But then at the time, Larry was writing this book, um, Connecting, and he asked me to come along as one of his feed, uh, feedback friends. Um, so you had probably eight to 10 of us that were giving him feedback. And it was the idea of, I've written so many books by myself. What would it be like to write a book out of community? And that was, this was the start of that. How do I not just reflect a book that is my thoughts on the world, but one where I invite people to be community and write it with me. And I remember thinking it's such a rare thing for an artist to invite somebody else. It'd be like Michelangelo right, doing Sistine Chapel. And then all of a sudden saying, oh, let's bring you in to do your stroke on the, on my masterpiece, or you to bring, if we were to walk up in, in any art studio and go and add our stroke to the painting, we would say that we've ruined it. And yet I think the art of heaven is gonna look so much radically different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Larry was starting to lean into is, what does it mean to be a community that creates together? 
And so that was some of the backdrop of me inviting. So this was the first book of Larry's that I was invited to read along with him as he wrote it and offer some feedback. I think that's spot on, Dunk, in respect to how he um, started to have a different vision in, yeah. this, in this in this book, a different, different mindset. And um, we had talked about some of the things going on, but it's interesting because there's a poem in here I think many of us have heard this poem, and he writes this this in the in the in the book connecting. He says, "This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through." We've heard this before. Yeah. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And then he says, "But so often we have we <laughs> have our own our own version of that poem." If you remember what he says, he says, "This world is not my home, but it will have to do." Um, I'll do all that I can to make my dreams come true. The angels aren't much help. <laughs> they tell me what's ahead. I don't like their plan. Things must work now instead. <laughs> it just was, that just wasn't, was, wasn't what he was committed to here. He knew this world was just, just did, did not work. Um, and it just was amazing. I, you know, it's interesting because with this book, as I've been looking it over again, much like a lot of the books that we've done, this was the book that um, uh, <laughs> that tell, that opens up with my story. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, Dad, I, I can just let let you all know that when he would do these kind of things, either speak about us publicly or put us in writing somewhere, he would always ask us permission to do that. And I said absolutely. I was grateful to 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 be able to the allow him to do that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about my story, I thought, and I, I just this just isn't about me at all. I don't, I don't know. I, I just sure hope that that's not what is coming across because that's not at all what I would hope would come across. But in, in reading what dad said about my story, it was all about how it impacted him and what was going on inside of him. And there's a number of things that, that are in the story that you can see in chapter one that aren't, that aren't in there. Yeah. Um, things like when, um, when he was coming down, he was in just total peace and, um, and, and just feeling very, um, at ease with what was happening as I was being kicked out of college. He then takes me to breakfast that morning. And I remember this like it was yesterday. And he says to me, how can I help? And that was a changing point in my life. Yeah. For sure. It was a, it was an example of, of, of grace that I had never seen. And it really, it's stuck with me to this day. So it's, it's, it's just amazing to see what, you know, what my, uh, you know, failed story, how it's impacted him. And I like to say, I said this to you today, Dunk, I like to say that I'm largely responsible for my folks' character development yeah. um, <laughs> over the years. They having to deal with me through through a lot of, you know, tough times when I was growing up because I was a hard-headed um, black sheep of the family, if you will. So, um, well, and Kep, I, I love the fact that you you offer in contrast you had a previous story that you told me today where your dad's response was not the same. <laughs> and you you did offer an opportunity for him to grow <laughs> in ways that um, he would have never chosen. He would have never said, yeah, I, I, God, thank you for my son um, who's rebelling um, because this is really producing something great in me. I, I don't think he ever wanted that story. And yet, I, I'm sure of it now that he's grateful for you because of what yeah. you offered. Yeah. I, I wonder I, if, you, if you want to tell even just a snippet of, if it's not out of place, but to tell the first response, how it compares to this later, um, how different of a story this one was. Sure. Um most people know that I was the challenging child for the Crab family. In high school, uh, as uh, just a few days before we were getting ready to graduate, me and a handful of guys, a bunch of bunch of guys, um, went and, and got drunk before school. And some of us got caught. I was one of the kids when one one of the boys showed up, and um, it was evident that he was not doing well. They started to look for people, and they looked for me, and they found me, and they found a few others of us. So. That was a tough time, and I remember sitting in the in the the courtroom for a, a minor consumption uh, charge. Um, and Dad was sitting with me, and he turned and he said, "I don't ever want to be here again." And I turned to him and I said, "Dad, you don't have to be here now." 
<laughs> and what he said then, yeah. a few seconds later, was what grabbed me at that point, is he said, I'm sorry I said that. Yeah. And that's all he said. And we, we sat there, we did my thing, I paid my fine, and we drove home. And, um, and uh, when he was dealing with me in college, such a different tone. And it was, yeah. it was really, I think, you know, uh, the beginning of the, of the shift that he had in the spiritual formation, spiritual direction way of what does it mean to connect with someone in a way that's only possible supernaturally. Yeah. And you and I've had some of those moments, Dunk. I was, you know, as we were reading, you've been, you've walked with me through Kimmy, yeah. through dad stuff. And I, I read this quote that today, and I'm just going to read it real quickly for, it's very short. And it's, um, it's by Henry Nowen. And, and now one says in, in, in the book, dad quotes him saying here, how do we handle someone who comes and talks to us this way? This is now and talking right now. That was the time of my extreme anguish during which I wondered whether I would uh, be able to hold on to my own life. Everything came crashing down. My self-esteem, my energy to love and work, my sense of, of being loved, my hope for healing, my trust in God, everything was gone. Uh, here was a writer, here I was a writer about the spiritual life, known as someone who loves God and gives hope to people, and I'm flat on the ground and in total darkness. And he talks about how do you, how do you, how do you talk to someone that way? Um, you know, we've had some of that, um, you know, I, I see some people asking some questions a little bit about Kimmy. She's doing well. About a month ago, she almost died. She had a kidney failure, um, crazy, crazy stuff. We rushed her to the emergency room and uh, she was in the ICU for four or five days. And poof, it just it just rocks your world. And how do you talk to someone in the midst of that kind of stuff going on? Don't unpack that a little bit because you did such a good job with me. Well, I, I think it's the same thing your dad has modeled for all these years is that you immediately go to the point where I have, I am completely out of control. I have nothing of any use, none of my techniques, none of my, all of the strategies go out the door at the moment that life becomes completely unraveled. And um, what I love with what your dad did, and he modeled it, not as a technique, but as a heart connection to you. And this is why I love the contrast of the two times with your dad and it's what I think opens the door for us to see what does it mean to genuinely connect with someone yeah and your dad was convinced and this is the shift that took place in him when and he he said what was the catalyst for the shift in him he would talk about um your rebellions um they they triggered things your brother's death as he watched his his, his brother, parents, yeah. yeah, bury their oldest son. Yep. But it was also right in the middle of this writing this book that he got his cancer diagnosis that he lived with for 26, 27 years. But the diagnosis came back then. That's the same kind of stuff that you've been dealing with over the last couple of years with Kimmy. And then a, another wave comes through. And this is a, a phrase that... Um, I just heard today that I think is apropos to what your dad kept in mind all the time. The, the phrase is, we're all dying. There's just a few of us that are more aware of it at, at any given moment. Most of us are trying to convince ourselves that we're not dying. And it's the he, writer of Hebrews says, it's the fear of death that holds us in bondage. We're trying to escape that. And your dad said, no. Yeah. I want to chase after that um, because in dying is part of the process. And that's the categories that come to play in this book of we have to mortify the flesh. We have to kill sin, those things that keep us from embracing the vivification, the, the old Puritan phrase that he loved, the vivification of the spirit, him coming alive. And so I think with you, <coughs> something seemed more alive in you as you're taking your, your wife to the hospital and you have no idea how bad it is. Hmm. Um, 
And yet something I'm guessing was at peace in you because of what had been made alive in you over the last couple of years. Yeah. It's hard to assess what's going on in you at the, at the moment when you're thinking through that. The doctor calls and says, she's dead Monday if you don't get her to the hospital tonight. And it's like, oh, um, people understand what kidney stuff's going on. She had a, a 19.8 creatinine level, which about a little after six, you can experience renal failure. People, they, they said they've never seen her numbers as high. So yeah. we've definitely proven that she is one tough gal. <laughs> and, and, and she's still here. God's got use for her. And he's, he's continuing to use her. I love what you just said, though, Dunk. And, and talk a little bit more. Dad talks so much about the flesh and yeah. sin and Satan. Yeah. And, and he just he just was, you know, and I just I've become so aware of the battle that's really going on the battle that we have with the flesh yeah um that i know that he experienced till the day he died yeah well i know we always hear that the three big enemies of a christian are the world <laughs> satan and the flesh and y- your dad says the world is too big for me satan is just going to be pestering me all the time the only one that i have any control over the only one that I have any awareness of that I can actually pray myself through um, is the one with the flesh. It's that interior, that interior piece. And I think the shift that um, that connecting brought about was a shift. Um, it wasn't just a shift in back in those days. I think this was right about the time that Christianity Today did a, a focused um article on your dad of the shift that was going on in him from a professional counselor to something else and um again back in the day it was oh he's he's abandoning counseling but what he clearly said over and over was he says i'm i'm not destroying the industry but the industry feeds on itself Mm -hmm. um it exists for if problems don't exist there's no need for a counselor and he kept asking the question, what's God's provision for it? Is it professional counselors or, or is it something different? And there was a, a shift in him yeah. that moved towards relationships that were already in existence. And that was the many people said that this was his professional suicide in the direction he went, because this was right about the time that he was shifting from teaching a, a counseling program in a at an institution to starting what was now is now in the rearview mirror as schools of spiritual direction and these intense communities that were talking about friendship shepherding elderly eldering and spiritual direction as god's provision but all of them if you notice it's they're all relational categories and what he saw, the, the limitation to the professional counseling model was a one directional relationship. The professional who does his practice to the, to the um, recipient, the, the one in need. But he said, I'm equally in need of the relationship that's existing. And that's the piece that, that shifted some of his mindset that um, the battle with the flesh, he was still battling. Yeah. Um, that <laughs> I remember at the time I asked him, I said, so Larry, how do you get accolades left and right? How do you not take them too seriously? And his response was wonderful. He says, well, when I, I go and I'm Dr. Crab at a conference, I come home and Larry has just stepped in the door and my wife was just not that impressed with me. And she seemed to know me better than anybody else that was sitting in the crowd. And I thought maybe I could trust her input a little bit more than all the accolades that I was getting left and right. Um, so it's, part of it was learning to trust the people who know me best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, as you sit here and start to, I just, I can just picture dad. I just start to hear his words. I hear his, hear him talking. I miss that guy all the time. What, what an incredible guy. Mm. He, he, you know, he used some harsh words in this book. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 you know, 
words like, you know, killing the urges and different things that he talks about. And he just didn't pull any punches. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so grateful in the, in the direction that he went with the spiritual direction. This was where you, you mentioned something today that I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit with, for our audience to hear, because I think it was important, Dunk. You said there's been other people in the industry, especially uh, psychologists, who say, you know, we're a lot like onions. We continue to just yeah. peel off the layers and layers, and it just gets deeper into the onion. Dad never believed that. Yeah. Talk a little bit about what, what Dad's thoughts were on some of that. Well, you, you, um, you know, the story is uh, better than, than me, but I, I know that one of the shifts that took place, there was a theological shift as much as a relational shift that was going on. So this is, um, there is a, a perception that if, if we start to peel back the layers in counseling, that the, the smell gets worse and stronger and more potent. But Larry started, there was a shift that was going on. So one of your dad's dear friends at the time, Dwight Edwards, had just written a book um, called The Revolution Within or something like that. Um, and it was all about what has actually taken place because of the new covenant. Um, and so it's the Ezekiel and the Jeremiah passages that talk about God looking forward to a day when he was actually going to put his very heart in his people, that they would no longer follow him just because of a law that was written down, disobedience to a law. And that's one of the things your dad tackles is, if I were just more disciplined and more obedient to what I know to be true, what he says is discipline won't get you to relationship. Um, it, it may be some of the categories that of, I discipline myself to go on dates with my wife, but if I'm not present with my wife, then all that discipline does nothing. So what what your dad saw a shift going on was this, there's something that's been actually transformed inside of me. And that was he, um, it was the second Peter, the be very beginning of it, where the very divine nature that we've been invited in to participate in the divine nature. And I know your dad would always say, now it's not like we've been invited in to be the fourth member of the Trinity. <laughs> no. But we have been invited to participate. The very same spirit that connects the Father and the Son is what allows us to connect with one another. So as you and I speak, Kep, there's another conversation going on. The Spirit's talking to you as, as I share words, and he's stirring up things in you. And as you share, it stirs up things about me of love and good deeds and works that we can participate together that's the connection of the father and son and spirit so along with the new covenant he talks in terms of the trinity becoming the very core of the gospel so there was a shift in him of what's what is the gospel well the good news is we not only have right relationship with god but the thing that connects the father and the son through the spirit is what can connect us now, that my heart is brand new. There's something that's changed inside of me that doesn't have to change a second time. So when he would talk about Romans 7, the very end of it, the battle, I keep doing the things I don't want to do and not doing the things I want to do, he would say the want has been changed. My deepest desire is no longer for sin, God's heart resides in me. My deepest desire, what I most want, is to put the life of the Father and Son on display in my life, regardless of the situation. So that puts on display the, the flesh and spirit battle, is he would talk about the weaker passions of the flesh and the deeper passions of the spirit. What's and I, I love that. You can live in the weakness or in the depth of the Father, Son, and Spirit. It, it, it's it's just amazing to see how the Holy Spirit works. Mm. And dad's told stories over the years that just make it too hard to deny that the Holy Spirit's on the move. Yeah. And one, an, a story that, that kind of follows up to the first chapter that is not in, in the chapter. Um, but dad talks about, you, you mentioned Dwight Edwards in the, in the book there, Revolution Within. Yeah. It was a time that um, I did not do, know Dwight at the time, but after I had gotten home shortly after I was, uh, relieved from my duties at college, um, they uh, uh, dad got a letter. 
I, I think literally that day, a letter showed up in the mail from Dwight. No. He calls Dwight up in Texas and just says, Dwight was a teaching tennis pro or a tennis pro in, in the past as, as I had been in, in different things. And, and, um, and he said, Dwight, I just got your letter and let me tell you what's going on with Kep a little bit. And I was wondering if he could maybe come down and whatever. And uh, Dwight said, you just got my letter? And dad said, yeah. And he said, I, I sent that letter six or seven months ago in the mail. So it's all these things that just how the, how the spirit is constantly working. Mm. And, 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 you know, and I, I love my grandpa's phrase that, you know, God is so much more interested in saving us than we are in being saved. <laughs> <laughs> I cling to that, you know? Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, and I think in terms of what, what chain reaction of, of, changing you started happening i mean this is what i think your dad saw was i'm going to a son who's broken right now um everything in his world is um falling apart and so he told you um how can i help and you, your response was what are my options yep, that's what i asked and and he told you what some options were and what some options weren't mm -hmm. And one of those options was your mom and I have had the best options up to now. We're not an option anymore. You need more than us. And so that's when that letter for Dwight just came full circle. And so what did you end up doing? I moved down to Texas after I went down there to a, a college group retreat. Dwight was a youth pastor at a, a church down there in College Station. I ended up moving down there um lived down there for 12 years met my bride down there yeah and um uh, it was it was just clearly the lord just maneuvering me it felt like like a like a pawn on a chessboard and i was so grateful um to look back and that and I, I know that what he's doing now even in my life with from my story that i just was refreshed to read again in the last few weeks as i was prepping for this to to the story that continues yeah. Um, and I know that the, the most important thing is what does it mean to put Jesus on display the way dad did? Um, yeah. You know, and um, and one of the things, you know, Dunk, that I wanted to uh, to kind of kind of close with, I know we've got we could continue to go on for a ton. But in the book, <clears throat> dad presents a little bit of a challenge to us in the epilogue. Yeah. And I'm just going to read just the first little bit of there and, and make a challenge to you guys that are watching us today. You folks. Um, in, in respect to what does it mean to connect to somebody in a way that is only supernaturally possible because of the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit in them. This is what my dad says here in the epilogue of the book Connecting. He says, getting started on anything worthwhile is difficult, whether a diet, an exercise program, or a campaign to make new friends. It's no different with connecting. Now that you've read this book, I hope you're finding yourself or finding within yourself a desire to experience a deeper level of relationship with someone, a level where substantial healing takes place. Uh, to help you get started, I want to suggest that you select one person in your life and write a letter with the theme of my vision for you. You might read chapter 16 again. He talks about the vision letters in chapter 16, which, of course, he unpacks even a little bit more in his book later called Soul Talk. But he says, it's not a wish list of, of what you would want them to change. But remember, it's, it's a good vision. A good vision is one that the Holy Spirit thought up long before you and has already been whispering to the other person. So your job is to audibly express what he has been wordlessly suggesting to you. Mm -hmm. So that's my challenge to us today. The rediscover the lost art of writing some letters to people. Mm. Amy found um found a letter from my dad just the other day um that made her weep and just encouraged her greatly that he wrote when he first heard about her diagnosis mm. they continue to touch and uh it's really important um to do those things those are intentional ways to to tell someone i care yeah and to connect and he continues to connect with us today from the other side <laughs> Yeah. it's just it's just amazing it's amazing dunk i am so grateful to have you as a brother yeah. and um is there anything you want to say as we get ready to wrap up with everyone today here well i love the the story you just told about kimmy because it, it echoes something that just happened this last week 
I, uh, my, most of you don't know, my wife and I just got off the road. We spent a year traveling around the United States for the ministry that we're part of. And we got back and we're road weary. And I remember I just crashed. I mean, I was feeling so discouraged. And I think it, so much so my doubts just started taking over. And I go, I don't even know if I believe any of this. I don't know. And it, in the past, this would have been when I would have called or texted Larry and said, hey, can we go grab a breakfast? <laughs> I'm, I'm just not, I, I don't know if I believe this very much today. And I was sitting in, in, my, in our bedroom. We have a, a chair that's right next to um, all of Larry's books. And, um, and, and also there's some books in there of just other writers that I just have loved. And I pulled off one of them, and it was a Friedrich Buechner book, um, who, um, when Larry made the move from uh, Denver over to Charlotte, I, I have this image of him. He's going through his library, and he doesn't want to carry all these books with him again. And he asks if I can take these three or four boxes of books to um, the used bookstore. And I said, I'm happy to, but can I go through them first? And pick out the ones I want. And I hadn't realized this was one of the books that was in there. And the reason why I knew it is I picked this up because I knew Beekner is one of those deep wrestlers uh, with life. And in the very back of it, I find, and you can see it here. <laughs> wow. Just chicken scratch of Larry. Yeah. Oh and, my gosh. And it's just him. It's a raw moment. And I, again, if you've never tried to um translate his hieroglyphics it, it's hard so I, I typed it out yep. and this was the words for for me from larry i wanted to talk to him and i found a book that he had in one of his darker moments he wrote this he says i'm fairly sure sometimes that christianity is true but there are moments even seasons when i really wonder there are even times, and I'm usually quietly angry during them, when I feel an inch away from saying all I say I believe, it just doesn't add up. There's too much confusion and mystery. I know I'm a man. I know I'm married. And I know I'm here. A and I know that I'm a Christian <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Not often. <laughs> I know even more certainly than I know I'm here that there is something invisible that, like the wind making ripples on the lake, I love that phrase, yeah. like the wind making ripples on a lake, lets us know it's here by doing something we can see. And it's that wind that I want to be moved by. I want to be a ripple on the lake. <laughs> I feel, and I feel that most when mystery seems a gateway to a wild pilgrimage. Wow. I, and that's his ramblings just at the back of a book as he's throwing out there his doubts. But then it, it stirs in him, I want to be part of this wind that's blowing. I know he used to talk in terms of um, the... the Ecclesiastes talks about life under the sun. That it's just chasing after the wind. But I, then he would always talk about, but what about life above the sun? <laughs> um, maybe there's actually a will behind the wind that's chasing after us. And that, that just stirred me. It stirred something in me as I was doubting this last week. And I remember just going to God, thanks God for being a father to me again. Thanks for bringing a trusting voice in the middle of all my crazy doubts that very few people will be able to reconcile in themselves, let alone reconcile with you. And yet, in the middle of the confusion and the mystery, we see the evidence of the wind blowing. Um, and that's, I think, what you were just alluding to, that the spirit is moving, even when we're not, we don't see it the same way we will someday face to face um but right now by faith we see the effects of the spirit oh. 
and and we get to go oh you are there um it's not a lie <laughs> i just as we get ready to wrap up here I, I i did the same thing last week i was just going through some books and i grabbed um lewis's a case for christianity and i opened it up just a really short little book um that i finished reading here just a little bit ago but in the beginning of it his dad's just a little paragraph he gave to me a couple sentences he said uh, kep as you get older um, and life can uh, begins to beat you down. You will have more more doubts. This book has allowed me. He said something to get to get through those doubts to realize that it's true and he's good. Yeah. And I was just like, wow. It was, it was just again one of those one of those things that was really powerful, you know. So, well, Dunk, I love you. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, keep an eye open. We've got some uh, a special guest joining us in October. Going to have Philip Yancey talking about his his book and chatting with him a little bit. I'm excited to do that. And we've got, um, we're going to continue to be going through the Larry Crabb catalog. Um, lots of books to continue to cover. So thank you all for joining us. I hope you're having a great summer and staying cool on these hot days. And um, I appreciate all of you have been, been remembering my wife and your prayers. I think that the Lord is moving in her life and in ours. So thank you for that. Dunk, thank you for joining us. I'm glad you're home safe. And thanks for joining me today. Guys, have a great day. Thank you, guys.